All right, let's answer some questions. PFTP and Posse, how similar is the end of the Belichick era in New England to the end of the Tom Landry era in Dallas? Both are Hall of Fame head coaches with amazing runs who fizzled out at the end after the stars got old and or left and the game seemingly passed them by. Well, I mean, the difference is Jerry Jones bought the team and fired Tom Landry. If the team hadn't been sold, I don't know how long Landry would have been there. With Belichick, this is his best player leaves, and after five years, it's clear that maybe the best player that he had had a lot to do with the success, and now it's just time for a change. It's time to get back to winning. It's time for the Patriots to try to rediscover whatever it was that made them such a great team with a new coach, a new way, a new approach. And, you know, what happened after Landry was fired and Jimmy Johnson was hired? They get Troy Aikman. Foundational piece, franchise quarterback, guy who helps with a great team around him, the Cowboys to win three Super Bowls. So you ultimately have to have the quarterback. Whatever the Patriots do next, they need a quarterback and they need somebody who can coach the most out of that quarterback to get back to the point where they have the kind of quarterback play that allows them to be a great team. PFDP and Posse, if a quarterback's armband with all the plays on it falls off during a play and the defense recovers it, do they have to give it back? And if so, why? It seems similar to losing a player to injury since shit happens in a physical game like pro football. Look, I I don't know if there's a rule on the books for what you're supposed to do if the quarterback loses his armband. We saw that on Sunday in the Cowboys-Bills game. Josh Allen's armband came off and somebody got it and gave it to him. I doubt that it's fair game to abscond with it if you're the defense. It's just one of those things that basic interests of good sportsmanship require both sides to comply with something like that. Give the guy his wristband back and let's go forward. I, I can't imagine there being any sort of a rule that would allow a defense to play finders keepers with a quarterback's armband with the plays on it. PFTP and Posse, could Belichick and Kraft just pawn this offseason contract extension off on another team? And since we don't know any details of the extension, maybe the Patriots only receive financial compensation for Belichick. Look, Belichick's making at least 20 million a year, maybe 25 million. And he was a free agent last year, but didn't become a free agent, didn't try to leave. I talked earlier that coaches never become free agents in the sense that they say, my contract's up and I'm going elsewhere. He could have gone anywhere he wanted last year and he didn't. Signed a two-year contract. The next year, 2024, is what has to be dealt with by the Patriots and by Belichick. Now, on one hand, I think the Patriots would like to move on from Belichick while also working out a deal where they trade him as a practical matter to another team. I think that Robert Kraft shouldn't be allowed to have his cake and eat it. I think he's either going to fire Belichick and owe him the difference between what Belichick was due to make next year and whatever someone else pays him, or just let him go or keep him. I think the solution here is, I've talked about it, I've written about it. The solution is the two sides just go their separate ways. Rip up the contract, Belichick leaves with no obligation for any new team to work out a trade with the Patriots, and Kraft has no financial obligation to Belichick. Belichick goes wherever he wants, gets whatever he's going to get paid, and he moves on. They completely separate, conscious uncoupling, and they move forward. That's the right outcome. I think Kraft is going to try to thread the needle, and I think Belichick is going to try to break the needle. The best thing they can do is shake hands, part company. Belichick's a free agent. Kraft owes nothing. Kraft gets nothing. Kraft goes and hires a new coach. Burn unit, you said yesterday you have to have a solution to the complaints made by Tom Brady. I made the point on PFT Live that Tom Brady wants to complain about defensive players getting flagged for hits to the head and neck area of defenseless players when it's quarterback's fault for throwing the hospital ball. Well, what are you going to do? Throw the flag on the quarterback? That was my point. He's identifying a problem and not providing a solution. The hip drop tackle, that's the question here. The problem is that that grabbing, twisting, and falling onto the legs of the ball carrier creates an enhanced risk of injury. What's the solution? Well, the easy solution is don't do it. Tackle the player without grabbing them by the waist twisting him and falling down. Find another way to get him to the ground. There's a gator roll, rugby style. Grab the legs. Grab the legs and hold on. Grab the ankles and hold on. Instead of grabbing the waist and falling on the legs. That's it. That's simple. 
the people who just don't want to have defensive football encumbered in any way, shape, or form are going to feign ignorance. I don't know what a hip drop tackle is. I don't know what else to do. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's just a way to say, I don't want to change. I want to have this in my arsenal. But the reality is it's injuring players. Tyreek Hill didn't play this past week because of a hip drop tackle. Uh, Ramondre Stevenson has been out for a few weeks now because of a hip drop tackle. Tony Pollard broke his ankle in the playoffs last year against the 49ers because of a hip drop tackle. You know, if we act like we care about players being healthy and making their money, why do we want a technique that is proven to be unsafe to be permitted as a way to get a guy to the ground? And I know you still got to get the, uh, the guy to the ground, but this is not the way to do it because it's not safe. When the horse collar tackle was identified as an unsafe technique, there was no uproar. There was no outcry. Oh, we must have this horse collar tackle. We must be able to pull the guy by the back of his shirt down to the ground. It went away and players comply. Hip drop tackle needs to go away and players will comply. So the easy solution is just don't do it. The more nuanced solution is grab his legs, get him around the ankles and hold on until he comes down. That is far safer than grabbing him around the waist twisting and falling with your body weight and or his body weight onto the legs of the player. Dr. J144, legal question. If college athletes eventually become employees, could their schools make them sign non-compete agreements? Wouldn't that end the transfer portal? Basically, it's a great question. Once they become employees, it's no different than the NFL, where you sign a contract that covers a certain number of years. One of the reasons the transfer portal has gone haywire is they're not employees. They can come and go as they choose. So if they become employees, that's one of the unintended consequences that will reduce movement by players. You will have players under contract for a certain number of years. Now it's up to the players to negotiate how long of a contract they sign. One, two, three, four, five. I don't know. But that's a great point. Once they become employees, they're subject to the same laws of contract that apply to any other employee who has a contract. We'll see where it goes. We need to get to the point where the players are getting paid. The reckoning is coming, and I trust lawsuits, groundswell, at least players are getting NIL money. Once they are employees of the schools, yes, they will sign contracts, and they will be required to honor those contracts, and they won't be able to jump to another school. Not will we have trades. That's an interesting point. Will colleges trade players? Will that be allowed? What will the rules be? See, the problem is, and this is the next step. Let's play this out. The players become employees. Then do they unionize? Like they tried to do at Northwestern several years ago? And do you have a union for every school? Or is that the point where the universities come together under the umbrella of the NCAA and there is basically an NCAA Players Association where you negotiate a global contract that addresses all of these things. What the pay will be, what the rights will be. Will there be some sort of free agency? Will there be trades? What are the rules now? That's the best way to do it. It works for the NFL to just have one global body that negotiates on behalf of all universities. And you're allowed to do it in a multi-employer bargaining unit. They'd be allowed to do it. Interesting. A lot of issues that are lurking if and when the NCAA gets to the point where it's paying players directly. Some of them will be good. Some of them will be not good. Some of them will be simple. And some of them will be complicated. So great question there, Dr. J144. Tyler Hergert, if you had to cover another sport as extensively as you do with football, what would you cover and why? I would just retire. There's no other sport I'm interested in enough and care about enough to cover every waking moment for the most part of every day. I spend most of my time writing about the NFL, talking about the NFL, thinking about the NFL. My only break is... When I ride my bike for an hour every day that I'm here, I ride my bike for an hour. Now I'll watch hard knocks. I'll watch games. I'll watch different things. So I'm still kind of glued in. I'll take calls. I'll do business. I'll, I'll send texts. As long as I don't fall off the bike, there's all sorts of stuff I can do. 
Obviously, meals, sleep, total of six a day on average, four and a half to five at night, an hour to an hour and a half in the afternoon. A couple of nights a week, my wife actually has to deal with me. We'll spend time together beyond eating dinner together and just the other times we see each other around the house, a little break here and there. A couple of nights a week, we'll watch something or go somewhere, go out to dinner, though we haven't done that in a while. And the few nights a week that I shut down and work on my hobby, you know, this used to be my hobby. Now writing fiction is my hobby and I only have so many hours per day, only so many days per week that I can even focus on that, especially during the season. Off season, I could probably do and I have done more. And it's a way that balances out. It's a stress reliever and it, it gives me a chance to write creatively something that has more relevance than everything I write at PFT because everything I write today by tomorrow doesn't matter. Everything I write tomorrow by the next day doesn't matter. I like writing something that maybe somebody will come across in 50 years after I'm dead and gone and they'll read it and they say, hey, that wasn't bad. Amused to death. I'm a realist Eagles fan. What would you say happened this season? They used to be able to run at will. They can't even get three yards if they wanted to right now. Absolutely everything is in shambles. How would you sum it up? Well, I think they miss the offensive coordinator and the defensive coordinator. They miss Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon. This is partially the curse of having a great team. Your coordinators get rewarded with head coaching jobs. Look at what Steichen's doing with the Colts. And Gannon's doing a good job with the Cardinals, given that the front office didn't really seem to be prioritizing winning this year. And they haven't been winning, but they haven't given up. They haven't dropped a turd like what we saw last Thursday night from the Chargers. That's for damn sure. The players are still trying hard. They missed Steichen and they missed Gannon. And look at what they've done with Desai. He's exiled to the booth and Matt Patricia's in charge. We talked about this each of the last two days on PFT Live. That play, when you got first and 10 on your own 45, 13 seconds left and two timeouts and all you need is a field goal to force overtime. To throw it to the 20, ill-advised. Play call, ill-advised decision-making. Somebody messed that up. And the comments from Jalen Hurts after the game, when I saw those live, I was, it was jarring. Question of commitment. Do enough players have a full commitment? So, look, it's hard to climb the mountain and go back to what Dennis Green used to call the Valley of Zero and Zero and do it all over again. And we know it's very hard when you get to the Super Bowl to get back. Not many teams have lost and gotten back and won. And it's been 20 years now since the team has won back to back. You have a huge target on you. Everyone is motivated to take you on. And they've hit a rough spot now. They should win their last three games. They should win the division. But if it's Rams, Eagles, that's an interesting wild card game. Rams could win that one. And then if the Eagles have to go to Dallas or San Francisco, they're not going to last. They're not going to last. If they have to go to San Francisco, it's over. If they have to go to Dallas, it's over. It's not a disappointing season. It's nothing to be ashamed of. I'm not saying they should give up. But the defense is lacking. And offensively, other than that brotherly shove, there's just issues. DeAndre Swift's done well in the run game from time to time. And, you know, Jason Kelsey's not going to be there much longer. This is a team, for a while it felt like, man, the Eagles are here to stay. They didn't even carry that vibe out to the end of the season. Rob Buffalo, would you add a Simsism in a future book and would your editor catch it? That's the first question. I think I've had some deliberate Simsisms. I think father of mine has like some of the mob dialogue has deliberate Simsisms in it. So I think I've already crossed that bridge. Second question, any concern over Jerry Jones getting richer from business with other teams via legends? i.e. construction and concessions for the new Bills stadium. I don't know that people are concerned about it. They're letting him do it. It's Jerry Jones and the Yankees coming together to create Legends Hospitality. And yes, it's heavily involved in like SoFi Stadium and other venues. So the oligarchs don't seem to have a problem with it. If they don't, why should we? Burn unit for the Brock Purdy versus Christian McCaffrey MVP talk. Which would affect the team more? 
Darnold in for Purdy or Mason in for McCaffrey? It's that losing Purdy would be more detrimental. I got to let her out. My wife's home. Hang on. Go ahead. When mommy's home, Macy no longer wants to be in here. She'll go out there and cry at the door until Jill walks in. So we don't know what Darnold can do. We know that Kyle Shanahan loves Sam Darnold. We have no idea what he can do. And this gets into like some of those analytics terms, like what's your, you know, the, the, the difference between the starter and the backup and why are you paying the starter all that money when the backup isn't that much worse and he's a lot cheaper. Now, in this case, obviously, Brock Purdy's a lot cheaper because of his contract as the last player drafted. But as it relates to overall value, I think McCaffrey, we don't know because we haven't seen Darnold play for them yet. But my hunch would be they'd miss McCaffrey more than they'd miss Purdy. Not by much, but that would be my hunch. Because look at how McCaffrey has transformed that offense in his year and a half with the team. Dr. J144, if you're Mike Tomlin, how do you handle George Pickens? Do you still play him because you're in a playoff push or bench him to send a message that you can't play here if you're not giving effort? I think it's something that you deal with. Practice field, meeting rooms, you get him ready, you give him one more chance. And if there's any more sign of loafing, you get him off the field. And then after the season, you trade him to somebody else, just like they did with Chase Claypool. The problem is, with Claypool, they kept all that stuff under wraps. And here come the unsuspecting Bears giving up what became the first pick in round two and as a practical matter, the last pick in round one for Claypool because nobody knew that he was a problem. It's going to be hard to get that kind of a pick for Pickens because everybody knows he's a potential problem given the way he's behaved this year. And it's a shame. I'm a big George Pickens fan. And I'm not saying he's actually wrong to feel the way he feels, but that doesn't mean you shut it down. That doesn't mean you loaf. You still go out and give it your all all the time. Daniel Kunamoto, do you think the matchup this weekend between the Ravens and 49ers will decide who wins MVP between Lamar Jackson and Brock Purdy? Sort of yes. As I said earlier, if the Ravens win, it's Jackson's. If the 49ers win, there's still this question of who is it? McCaffrey, Purdy? You can make a case for Debo. They're all being very polite with each other. Trent Williams is a guy that it's never going to happen. An offensive lineman has never been MVP. A kicker has been MVP, but an offensive lineman has never been you can make the argument that he's as important as anyone to that offense. Justin Prasuti, since 2021, the Steelers have won only three games by more than eight points. It seems like they masked the problems with a little luck and a little pasta meatballs renegade. Do you think an offensive head coach would be better suited for Pickett's development and growth slash maturity of young talent on offense? You know, the problem is, going back to Chuck Noll, they've, they've gone defensive coach. If they move on to a new head coach, if Mike Tomlin wants to leave, they trade him, whatever, are they going to go offensive coach or are they going to go defensive coach? Interesting question for Art Rooney, who will be ultimately making the call as to who the next coach would be if it comes to that. I'm a firm believer, as you may recall, in having an offensive head coach at all times because it's an offensive league. You want your quarterback and your head coach to have that relationship where they, they go Sean Payton, Drew Brees for 10, 15 years. Because if you have a defensive coach, your offensive coordinator, if he works well with your quarterback, he gets rewarded with a head coaching job somewhere else. And then you better hope the next offensive coordinator isn't Ken Dorsey. So I'd always go offensive head coach. All right. I should probably wrap this up. Delete Brow. From what you can see in your reporting, what is the state of the relationship between Sean Payton and Russell Wilson? It appears they've worked out a way to work, but does Peyton see Russ as the future? Does he want to cut bait and trade for Justin Fields or draft a starter? I mean, look, we don't know any of that because he's not going to say so. All I know is there are 37 million reasons for the Broncos to at least consider a future without Russell Wilson. That's how much becomes fully vested in March. If they don't cut him by then, they're going to have him for at least two more years. So is Sean Payton comfortable working with him or is there someone else Sean Payton thinks he would be better working with that reaction by Peyton to Wilson on Saturday night was so bizarre. And the way that Wilson, excuse me, the way that Peyton was going at Wilson, it just made me think that it was the culmination of just frustrations and trying to coach this guy and he can't get through to him. And how many times have I told you this? I've told you this over and over again, just the body language and just the way the words were coming out. It felt like that kind of, as somebody who's been on the receiving end of that kind of a tongue lashing, it felt like it was more than just the moment that it was, how many times do we have to freaking do this? How many times do I have to tell you this? I've told you this. Damn it, I've told you this. I've told you this time and again. That's what it felt like to me. 
All right, I should probably wrap this up. Tom Marshall, Arizona, UK. If the NFL really is riddled with mediocrity, why didn't Tom Brady unretire? I, it's a great question. This would have been a perfect year for him to come back and play for somebody. I just think once he made the decision that he was going to be, you know, more present for his kids and it was just time. He said last year he still loves football. He still could play at a high level and he could. He just decided it was time to walk away. And I'm curious to see how he's going to be next year working for Fox. If that only happens, some think it won't. I think it will. It's too much money for him to walk away from. What's his style going to be? Is he going to be old man yelling at clouds? Is he going to be, you know, back in my day, is he always going to bring it back to himself? That was where both Joe Montana and Bill Walsh were kind of bad as broadcasters. They always tried to bring it back to themselves. You can't be first person in all this. You can weave in your own experiences without saying, in my experience, it was this. We did this. We did that. Just talk about what they're doing and talk about what maybe they should do differently. It can't be too much about we did this, I did this, I would do that, we would do that. There, there, there's, just, there's a. It's not all that subtle. You know it when you hear it. I'm just going to be curious how much of his own personal experiences are mentioned expressly when he's calling these games. Mr. Palmerson, is Tommy DeVito the real deal or just a fun story and a passing fad? I mean, based on how he played against the Saints, maybe a passing fad. He he came in and he played well. And he's played well enough to be the backup to Daniel Jones. Is he going to be a starter someday? I don't know. But so far, as an undrafted free agent, it's been a nice story. And we always like a nice story. We'll see where it goes from here. Buffalo expat. Regarding Seattle waiting until kickoff to announce their starting quarterback on Monday night, is there no NFL rule about this? Other professional sports punish teams for failing to provide complete starting lineups. How does the fine, happy NFL not have a similar rule in place? You're not required to announce a starter per se. You have to have a depth chart. You're not required to adhere to the depth chart. In this case, you have a quarterback who was injured. You're making the decision about whether or not the injured quarterback is going to be able to play. You're making it at the last possible minute, and you're just keeping your mouth shut about it. There's not a problem with it. Now, it would be interesting to see what would happen if a team would have two quarterbacks, name them co-starters in the regular season, and run it all the way up to kickoff. The, the, the reality is, if both quarterbacks are healthy, see, if you've got a quarterback who's injured and isn't practicing, and the backup is taking the reps with the first team, the fact that the backup's taking the reps doesn't tell us that the starter's not going to play. We don't know the starter's not going to play until he doesn't play. If you had two healthy quarterbacks and you were trying to play this game right up until kickoff, it's very hard to get everyone to shut up. There's too many people who know who's getting the reps, and it's going to get out that way. Every once in a while, there's a coach who thinks he's going to be the one to kind of coerce his players and everyone around the team into not saying anything. It's hard to do. So I think the opportunity just fell into Pete Carroll's lap, and he took full advantage of it. Are the Cowboys pretenders or contenders, asks Joe Don. Well, point Chris Sims made when it was 31-3. You lose like that in December, home or away, it doesn't matter. You lose like that in December, how are you a Super Bowl contender? How are you going to make it to the top of the mountain? They've already lost 42-10 to to the 49ers. 31-10 to the Bills. How are you going to make it? What's, what, what are you going to access that's going to allow you to win those games in the playoffs when you weren't able to access it on that, that day in Buffalo when ultimately Cowboys would have taken control of the division if they'd won that game, given that the Eagles lost? That's the one thing. I'll, I'll end with this. Wrote about it yesterday, talked about it today on PFT Live. The idea that if the Cowboys win out, they've got the Dolphins, then the Lions, then the Commanders. And if the Eagles went out, Giants, Cardinals, Giants, if both teams went out and they had the same record, the Eagles will win the division most likely on the fifth tiebreaker, strength of victory, which is the cumulative one loss percentage of all the teams that you've beaten. The Eagles currently have a pretty large lead. The Cowboys opponents that they've beaten are just over 50%. The teams that the Eagles have bitten, uh, beaten are, are, I think, at or north of 60 as their winning percentage cumulatively. It's amazing to think we'd go five down on the tiebreakers to determine the huge difference between two and five.
That's a huge difference. Two, you're at home, wild card round, facing the seventh seed. Five, you're on the road against the four seed. And, and really, maybe it's better to be five this year. You go play the NFC South champion instead of having a team like the Rams, who are hot and maybe getting hotter coming into your town in the wild card round. We've never seen seven beat two. It's probably better to be two. All the Eagles have to do to be two is win the next three games, Giants, Cardinals, Giants, and hope that this huge advantage they currently have in strength of victory doesn't collapse between now and the end of the regular season. All right, that's it. Merry Christmas to everybody out there. Happy holidays. Be safe. Be smart. I'm not signing off until after Christmas, though, because what we have coming up, Thursday, PFT Live, then the Joint Megapix podcast, Friday, PFT Live, Saturday, coverage starts at 3 o'clock Eastern on NBC and Peacock, Bengals at Steelers, Bridge Show in between, and then B Buffalo Bills at LA Chargers exclusively on Peacock Holiday Doubleheader, and then we'll be plugged in all day Sunday. I'm getting to stay home this weekend, so I'm going to be down in the barn for the first time since last Christmas Eve. I'll be down in the barn watching all the games on that 16th Sunday of the regular season. So that'll be fun. Looking forward to that. And then Monday, we got the three games, and it all ends with Ravens 49ers. And Tuesday morning on the 26th, 7 to 9 Eastern, Sims and I will break down everything that happens in the latest edition of the game of the year. We'll see if it's a game or not between the Ravens and the 49ers. But a lot of football between now and then. A lot to talk about here at PFT Live, profootballtalk.com. Thanks, as always, for some of your time. Stick with us through Christmas Day and beyond. We'll talk to you real soon. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.